want to introduce myself. My name is Emmeline Zhao. I'm a senior editor for special projects uh, for the 74. We're a nonprofit, nonpartisan, education specific news website. Um, we focus on investigative journalism, feature storytelling, and solutions based journalism. Um, you can find us on Twitter at the 74. Want to get started by talking a little bit about first what all of these generations mean. Uh, I think everybody has a very different definition of what a millennial is, but for our purposes, we'll try to keep things simple uh, and define a millennial as uh, those born between 1981 and 1997. Millennials are quickly overtaking older generations as the largest share of both the general population as well as the share of eligible voters in the United States. Um, more than one in three American labor force participants are now millennials, uh, making millennials the largest generation in the U.S. labor force today. So millennials in America have grown up with choice in every single way and have had more opportunities for choice in education than any generation in history. Uh, more than half of U.S. states offer some form of school choice today. A 2017 Gen Forward survey, which is a bi-monthly survey of millennials conducted by researchers at the University of Chicago, found that support for charter schools and school choice is high among millennials across all ethnicities. So my question for the panelists here is given all of this millennial support, why has school choice been such a battleground issue? So the millennial voice in education is super, it's critical, 18. So that says 18 to 34. I think it's like 23 to 38 right now. So we were one of the, or the first generation that really had an opportunity to experience free choice. And that, I took a lift here because I got, uh, I got pinged. I don't know if you do this, but when I'm at the airport, I look to see what's cheaper, Lyft or Uber, depending on where I'm going. And Lyft was like, hey, I'm gonna give you a special code. I'm gonna give you $3 off your ride. So guess what I did? I took Lyft. So that is free choice. I'm ex I'm ex I could have taken a taxi, I could have taken Uber, I, but I took Lyft. So I say that because we, my parents, if they show up somewhere, they're not doing the same thing. It's a different generation. We experience things in a very different way. And choice should be about desire. What do we want? I think we're designing and we're making conditions um, for learning that literally just don't exist. Just the way that our life and our world is changing, we should be open to that and excited about that. Um, and I think that that's one of the ways that we're engaging in education and in choice specifically. And it's an exciting moment and it's also a very charged moment because we, we have a very sentimental, often emotional and traumatic um, attachment to our educational journey at times. And that makes it hard. So that's all I'll say because I have brilliant co-panelists that are gonna chime in now. Yeah. So I, I agree with, um, Evie, in terms of like how millennials approach all kinds of options, right? And we, we look for choice in everything that we do. Um, and so choosing a school should be no different, and it is no different. Um, thinking about why school choice is such a battleground issue, um, that kind of spans across all generations. And I really think that we need to look back into our history and look at racial disparities and um, key moments in history that have really changed the way different populations view choice, right? So um, thinking about um, even like the NAACP's moratorium on charter schools, if you look back at um, the history of African Americans in education, um, there is a reason <laughs> that um, school choice is viewed as a privatization of schools, right? Um, from the 19, I'd say, late 1940s to 1970s, I mean, there were um, a lot of things that black communities suffered um, that affected jobs um, and the types of education, the quality of education that they received, um, which makes people a bit apprehensive. I think that their children now, which are millennials, um, have that in the rear view mirror, um, and they're looking forward, right? Um, and so they want to pick up the ball and run forward, and they want to have 
all of the options that they can at their disposal. You know, for me, I think you know, part of being a millennial is, you know, kind of pushing back on everything that uh, we kind of knew to be true at one time, our parents' generation ideals. Um, you know, I just think about my own personal experience, like as a first-generation college student, you know, going through a, a traditional public school system, getting out of that system unprepared for uh, the next level uh, at college, and then too, then getting out of college and realizing even then, the market is different, there are no jobs uh, open and available for the degree that I pursued. And so when we think about like this conversation about choice, it is, you know, um, the old method may not be working for everyone. And, and how can we uh, kind of push back and say, you know, what else is out there? And I think that is kind of inherent to like the millennial experience, which is what else is out there? Um, Evie mentioned a really good point about about rideshare, Lyft, and Uber. I mean, competition is is kind of the backbone of uh, capitalism in this country. And so, you know, does it make sense for us to compete for all industries and sectors? But then, when we get to schools, it's a uh, you know monopoly on one end. And so, I think. Um, it's a battleground issue, and then, and then again, where we are in today's kind of political climate and and world, everything is a battleground issue. And if we're not prepared to fight on one side or the other, like it'll it'll eat you up. So the data basically suggests that school choice, uh, is, at least when targeted to low income students, it receives significant support from millennials, um, but school choice actually didn't even make the first the top three list of solutions, uh, suggested solutions, to improving public education. The top three were to um, in increase school funding, improve teacher training, and increase teacher pay. So why now, more than ever, should we be focusing on school choice? You know, those three issues, um, I'd love to kind of walk through them again. So we talk about increasing funding, which is, I think, you know, everyone who says, who talks about education is like, we need to increase funding, we need to increase funding. I think that in and of itself is, you know, it doesn't solve problems. You know, the core of a lot of the challenges that, that mostly low-income schools face is, uh, you know, systemic, right? Bureaucracies, they're too tied up. Resources are too centralized, held. And so what we know is resources are not getting to the school level where they need to be, and adding more dollars to that problem doesn't, doesn't fix it if we don't look at the root cause of it. Um, I think, too, you know, this, this, you know, teacher pay is, is an interesting discussion because we do know that our teachers are not paid and should be paid more. Um, but I think the, 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 the idea that we just say, hey, if we pay teachers more, all of our education issues would be solved. And I just question that because I'm thinking, well, damn, are our, our teachers just like, well, I'm not getting paid enough, so I'll do the bare minimum teaching? Like, that's an interesting argument to make. And I do think that we should increase teacher pay, but that's an interesting discussion. And then uh, teacher training, I think, is actually a really good one on that list. But out of all of them, the idea that you know we can provide you know new methods, new options, new innovative approaches, I think should be number one um, now more than ever because I mean we're never going to get enough resources and dollars, increasing funding. We're <laughs> I've already mentioned my case on the other two, um, but I think we should be doing everything we can, trying every single option all at once. And then the last thing I'll say before I pass it over to the panelists is whenever we have this conversation, I think too many people, um, I think in their minds, they have this idea that it is, you know, uh, this or that. And it, it's, it's always definitely like both and more so that, you know, just because we, we talk about, you know, providing more access to charter schools or we talk about giving students an opportunity to attend a private school that otherwise would not have an opportunity doesn't mean that we're saying some other option uh, is less than or not as important or just as valuable. Right. I also think that... Um we need to talk about like, the definition of school choice. I think if you surveyed a crowd, you're gonna get a different, different definition about school choice from everyone in the crowd, right? So that's problem number one, I think, right? Um, it can't be the number one issue if no one understands what it is. Um, I also think that it is, um, it's a very politically charged term, right? Um, some people, uh, use it to their benefit in some ways, and some people use the term uh, to make sure that there is no funding for vouchers or for charter schools, um, or that there is a cap on charter schools, right? Um, and so there is, there, there's a group of people that benefit from creating confusion, 
mm. in the marketplace around school choice, right? Um, it can't be the most important issue if you don't understand what it is. So I have, um, in Colorado, I got the privilege of working for John Hickenlooper, um, who's then governor now, running for president. And we got to expand funding for equal fund equalizing funding for charter school kids in Colorado. And if you take all of the charter school kids in the state, they make up a larger school district than our largest school, like public traditional school district. So I say that because these charter schools are taking more free and reduced lunch kids, more kids of color, um, and kids who normally would attend their neighborhood school. Um, and the majority of that time, I can say confidently, it would be low performing or failing. And it's giving them opportunities and it's giving them a choice that they would have never have probably had. I was an organizer in a past life and grew up in a, as an immigrant kid. And I do think, you know, as I was preparing for this panel, I was like, well, what's my choice story? I didn't go to a private school. I didn't go to a magnet school. I didn't go to a charter school because my parents didn't know. Coming from another country, just being able to access at school, you make assumptions about the quality of it. And if you're not engaging in a system, and if you're not engaging parents, I think in some of our, I mean, you two are much closer to this work now, like you are making a choice even if you're not engaging in the choice. Like just going to the school across the street, not knowing is a choice. And the more we can walk and chew gum at the same time and expand those options for all of our kids, the more of us up here on panels, like the more that's gonna happen, right? Like the more it shouldn't be like, oh, good job, Evie, good job, Mandel, good job, Lila, like, you survived the like poverty and like the student of color Olympics, you made it, you're here at South by Southwest. Like everybody should have access to those same opportunities. And I think that's how I look at choice and why it's so critical now, because like there is no other option. Now we're now we're having kids and our friends are having kids and they're grappling with all of this information and don't know what a definition is, right? Like we, it's, we have to be active and we have to be part of the conversation or we're, it, the conversation's gonna keep going without us. Mm. And then we're gonna be mad. We're gonna tweet about it. <laughs> so whose responsibility is it to get that definition right? And whose responsibility is it to get the right information out there. We're definitely in, in an age of information wealth. Um, but, you know, as young people, how do we get that right? So I personally leverage social media. I mean, I think it's everyone's responsibility to get it right and to get that information out there. Uh, practically, is that going to happen? Absolutely not. Um, as, I, as I mentioned, some people benefit from the confusion, right? And so um, I work every day and I know um, other panelists are working every day um, at the 74. You guys are putting out articles to um, kind of educate people about what choices and what options they have. And there are lots of other people uh, doing really great work with the, like, that are, they're doing authentic and respectful work with the goal of making sure that people have um, accurate information uh, that they can take action on. Facts and data in the last couple of years seem to not matter, right? Like there's this idea mm -hmm. that doesn't matter how much data we present to people. Sometimes they just want to know that their kid is going to be safe, that their the culture in a certain school is going to fit what their family needs are. So I do think while well, data and information is incredibly critical, for some people that doesn't do much. Right? Like, and that's okay. And expanding and being able to have conversations about who gets to decide what data is data, like anyone can make data say whatever it wants. Mm -hmm. Like I think that that's just the truth. But having access and having inviting families in and students in to be part mm -hmm. of that conversation about what metrics or what sorts of um, accountability factors there are to making a school what they want is important. Um, I think introducing people that have never experienced choice to the idea of choice in their everyday lives mm -hmm. is the biggest thing, like the, that's the biggest step that you can take in this work. 
Um, so like it, I work at Families Empowered and we work with tons of families all day that don't have, the, that, that cannot make decisions about what they eat, right? Because they're accessing food through food stamps and so they're, they're limited. They're given you know, a certain category of different things that they can, can eat. Um, people tell them that they can only attend their zone school. And so they go up the street. And there might be a school right behind them that they don't ever walk into. They don't ever ask people about that school because they don't think that they have a choice. Mm -hmm. um, if you are financially constrained, um, there are lots of choices that people make every day that you never have the opportunity to make. So just educating people and letting them know that they have choices in life, mm -hmm. I think, is the first step. Mm -hmm. And then you can talk about school choice and other options and what these options mean. One thing that we also want to get to the root of is this is all a conversation of equity. Um, millennials are overwhelmingly diverse. Um, they are becoming the most diverse generation in history. Um, and School choice also tends to serve an overwhelmingly larger share of low-income students and students of color. Um, so I think that the one thing that we really want to talk about too is outcomes. The question is, you know, does school choice work? Uh, and we've realized that it's a very difficult question to answer. Uh, it's hard to disentangle the performance of a school uh, from the selection of its students, and as we all know, Charter schools cannot actually select their students. It's largely through a lottery system. Uh, there's private school vouchers in some states where parents can use public funding to, towards private school tuition. Um, and then you guys can also speak to like innovation schools and district kind of uh, district schools that are different from traditional public schools. Uh, so that's all to say that there's a lot of a lot of the research shows that there's no blanket statement on whether schools of choice work. Um, but there are some promising results in that, uh, I'll actually pull up the numbers. Uh, the research shows that the benefits of attending schools of choice are greatest for outcomes other than test scores. So they're actually showing specifically the likelihood that a student will graduate and enroll in college are a lot higher. Um, and also attending a school of choice is especially beneficial for minority students living in urban areas. So, uh, Mendel, you are based in Memphis, and the district has 80,000 students, 40,000 of which come from families with incomes under $10,000 a year. Um, and the city is 70% African American. So can you speak to how school choice has affected the community there? Yeah, um, I mean, our situation in Memphis is really interesting. We have um, eight uh, school districts uh, for public school students in, in Memphis. Um, we have one district that our state launched uh, a few years ago to try and tackle uh, 69 of our uh, lowest performing schools uh, within the district. They convert them uh, to uh, charter CMOs who focus exclusively on how we transform those schools and improve them from the bottom 5% to uh, top 25 over a certain period of time. Um, within our traditional, our large traditional school district, we, they also have a what they call um, their innovation zone, which is um, you know how can they uh, you know self transform uh, schools in the bottom five percent within the district who are not you know within our state, um, and then we have six municipal districts. But I think embedded in in, in that challenge is here we have a city that is seventy percent. African American, um, with 100,000 students split between eight school districts, and um, it's very much a race and class issue. We have six municipal districts outside of our county who serve largely all of the white students um, who broke away from the district out of concern um, when our district decided to merge a few years ago, and I think that is embedded in this in this discussion. Um, but what, what's really interesting um, about the work in Memphis is we kind of run the gamut on, on kind of options. We have our public charter schools who focus exclusively on kind of school turnaround and school transformation. We have our traditional district schools um, that we all know, um, and then uh, a ton of different private school options, both religious and non, uh, figuring out how we can kind of improve the quality of education for those students. And I think, um, you know, the interesting thing about it is we see these debates break out on like, you know, what actually defines a good school. For a lot of parents, it's safety, right? You know, they, they, they might live in a neighborhood where kid walking to school is super unsafe, so they're looking at a safety marker. We have some schools that are focused exclusively on like kind of academic performance and, you know, how 
you know, what's the likelihood of a kid graduating school. But then there are a whole host of other reasons that parents decide to send their kids to certain schools, whether it is, you know, uh, convenience of the school being next door, it's academic course contact. Um, she had a slide up about magnets earlier. Um, could be uh, in Memphis, our magnets are optional schools and they are designed uh, both to curb white flight, but also have like program, uh, programmatic that are meant to attract students. Um, and so we have it all in Memphis, I said a lot, but we have it all in Memphis. And what's interesting is it is, uh, the conversation is, you know, what is gonna be best for parents. The challenge is always a resource issue. We got all these districts competing for resources and dollars, and then we have conversations like, oh, you're trying to steal money from public schools, and it is just a, a deeper discussion about how we actually fund schools. Um, and what that means when we, when we start throwing out like all these crazy words like privatization and what have you, so. Lala, you have a really interesting choice story about yourself. Can you tell us about your personal experience with that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I was actually born here in Austin. My, my parents are from Houston, but I was born here in Austin. Um, and my family moved back to the Houston area looking for a really high quality uh, public school district and moved to a suburb just south of Houston. Um, and, you know, upon doing some research, they were really interested in the gifted and talented program. Um, and obviously it was not codified, but they had an unwritten rule that they did not test minorities for GT programs. That was probably back in 1989, before the first charter school. Um, For those that don't know, can you say what GC programs are? Oh, gifted and talented programs. Uh, so these are programs where either your teacher, if you're already in school, has to identify you as being someone that is potentially gifted and talented, um, and you'll be either put into a different class or provided uh, supplemental coursework to enhance your talents. Um, so, but yeah, so they had a, an unwritten rule that they did not test minorities for uh, gifted and talented programs. Um, and so fortunately, I mean, I, I am lucky. <laughs> um, my parents were able to put me in private school, um, which is really awesome. It's something that uh, the majority of families cannot uh, pay for outright. Um, and so I, I, you know, went to private school, uh, two different ones, uh, one that was uh, like kind of of the Methodist religion. Um, and then after that, I went to a Catholic school um, and had an unfortunate incident there. And my parents were looking for another school option. Uh, they looked at some more private schools. Uh, they looked at public schools and were really trying to figure out what the maze of options was, looking at magnet schools and even trying to figure out what a magnet school was because they didn't know. Um, they looked at some Vanguard schools and they ultimately put me into a school that was not a Vanguard school. Vanguard is kind of like a gifted and talented in the Houston area. Um, it was not a Vanguard or a magnet school, um, but it was a school that had a pre-AP program. It was a small neighborhood school in the Tanglewood area, which is a pretty nice area. Um, and so I was able to uh, get a transfer. Um, it was like a minority majority transfer uh, that came about in the 70s to combat uh, segregation. I got a transfer to go to that middle school um, and was the only black person in, actually, I think I was the only minority, the only black or brown person in that pre-AP program. Um, it was really great, set me up great for high school. I had uh, three high school classes that I took in middle school and so I was ahead when I went to high school. And when I went to high school, I ultimately went to a magnet school. as a foreign language magnet high school. It was one of the top three um, in Houston where I got a phenomenal education. Um, it was a school that um, served about 4,000 students. So each grade level had about 1,000 students. And out of 1,000 students, uh, there were generally 100 in the AP program. Um, and so I was one of three brown and black people in that program um, when I graduated. Uh, so my parents <laughs> utilized school choice before school choice was a term. Right, and there are plenty of other people that are utilizing school choice, and they're not telling you that. Right, um, so kind of thinking back to your previous question, like, does school choice work? Ask wealthy people, does school, cho does school choice work? Mm -hmm. Ask mm -hmm. people that know how to navigate the system, does school choice work? Like, I am, I am a testament <laughs> that school choice does work. Mm. It really does. Um, and I saw people 
that were even zoned to some of the schools that I went to that were not in the programs that I went to get left behind. Abby. I want to say just one yeah, more thing. Keep going. <laughs> Thinking about higher education, uh, everybody that uses a voucher or a Pell Grant, which is a voucher, mm. believes in school choice too, say that. Say that. right? So, um, like, I love to hear from people in the labor union or teachers or people that are so anti-school choice but totally took full advantage of Pell Grants when they went to college. That's a voucher. So. Similar to magnet schools, too. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, so we'll come back to that. Uh, Evie, when you were working for Governor Hickenlooper's office in Colorado in a very choice-friendly state, um, can you tell us what that climate looked like and what it was uh, what it was like to do the work with, with schools and with families there? Yeah. So Colorado is, as I mentioned before, it's like the ideal policy utopia for <laughs> charters and um, a lot of education scholarship opportunities as well. Mm -hmm. I won't call them vouchers anymore because I've, I've learned a lot during this conference. Um, so I would say that I, I do hear the sentiment around, like, this can be an incredibly divisive topic um, because the moment you say charters, the moment you say choice, and the moment you say voucher, you have already had a trigger of whether you support it, whether your friends support it, whether you come out on Facebook and say, hey, I'm for this. There's instantly, if I were to post on my Facebook right now and said, I was a panelist, I was talking about school choice, I do believe in vouchers. I would have some hate mail, um, and mostly, like, I welcome it because I think I also welcome the conversation around like what that means. Mm -hmm. If you have a little one in Colorado right now, we have the Denver Preschool Program. That means that Denver gives you money to choose and incentivizes quality of early childhood education, and it incentivizes the quality of that program per dollar. So it actually, if you're a parent, Emery, I'm picking on him because he's in the front row and I know him and a lot of you aren't paying attention, so I'm like <laughs> picking on you next. Um, you have a little baby, so it incentivizes you to pick the best quality option for your kid and it gives you more money to be able to do so. That's a voucher. But people are like, no, 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 no. Early childhood, that, that's, not, like, that's not part of the public. Like it is, it's the taxpayer money. And I think we have to just, I wanna encourage us to be more open to ideas because they're working. Like more moms, more working moms have access to quality early childhood education because of this program. And that's a good thing. It, it gets people, to, it moves people from different income levels. That's good. I'm not saying that there aren't any issues in Colorado and in the policy landscape, but I do think there's more flexibility in what school looks like for a lot of different families. I know a lot of families in Denver from very progressive communities that are like on this like reschool movement, like no, you know, like I have this feeling about traditional public schools, so I'm gonna homeschool my kid and we're gonna do like very culturally relevant curriculum, great. Go for it, do it. Mm -hmm. If that's what works for your family, why should I tell you different? I don't have a kid. There's no kid that has exited this body. Like, do you. <laughs> and I, <laughs> it's not, like, I'm not trying to tell you what to do. But I, I want you to be well informed and I want you to be supported on the policy stand, standpoint, right? But I also had a governor and a boss that I worked for that probably knew he wanted to run for office later on. <laughs> Here we are. Um, and when the opportunity to support a tax scholarship, um, you know, went back and forth behind the scenes on how to support that because it's very divisive and not just divisive on one side of the aisle, on both sides. And you make enemies fast. And I, I think if you take anything away from this panel is that school choice works because I know when it doesn't work, I have two younger brothers one of them dropped out of high school, and the other one is unfortunately incarcerated. So 
had we had been able to have these conversations as a family and have access to different choices, I'm not saying that their lives would have changed dramatically, but I'm also saying maybe they could have. You know, like we don't know the other side of that coin right now. Um, but there's also really cool opportunities, like there's an opportunity to like charterize, you know, programs in for incarcerated individuals now. Like there are really cool things that you can do in this world. We just have to get past this like, yes, there, there are things that have happened here that mm -hmm. we don't like. Mm -hmm. But there's also like a world of opportunity on the other side if we come together and have conversations. So I, that's what I would encourage you and biggest takeaways from Colorado. Can we take a step back and just talk about what schools of choice actually look like? Because I feel like for a lot of people that have never stepped foot in a school of choice, they don't actually, they can't conceptualize what that is. Um, and you know, in the work that we've been doing at the 74, I spent the last two years probably traveling the country, going to different schools and seeing them firsthand. And you know, some of the ones I point to are like the Paramount schools in Indianapolis, um, part of the Innovation Network, which is they're doing some really cool things. The, they give the principals a lot of autonomy over the curriculum and over the way that kids learn. Um, the principal, I was telling somebody this story the other day, the principal loves cheese. So he's teaching them science by uh, allowing the elementary schoolers to milk the goats in the morning and the middle schoolers take that milk in and they, they pasteurize it. And then the older middle schoolers make the actual cheese. Um, so that's all to say that you know kids have very different learning styles, and so what are kind of the really cool things that you guys have seen in the schools of choice in your communities? Um, yeah, I mean, I'll give you two from Memphis. Uh, one that I really love is um, Grizzlies Prep. It is a, a five through eight uh, all boy charter school in downtown Memphis. Um, and the school demographic is 97% African American, 1% uh, Hispanic, and 2% uh, white. Um, but here is a school that was started um, a few years ago by, by uh, two former uh, language arts teachers. Um, they really wanted to, to specialize on how can we uh, support literacy in young men, uh, and particularly you know, uh, men from low-income backgrounds, and, and how do we um, help encourage and foster an environment where um, you know, middle school boys could, could be themselves and flourish. Um, and so, you know, without imagining the smell of the building, um, it is a, a great place. These kids are, are bouncing off the walls and, and they're focused on literacy. So if you walk in the door, um, you're bound to have four or five kids come up to you and talk to you about a book that they're reading. Um, and I think it's just super powerful. Um, another is uh, Freedom Prep Charter Schools. Uh, it's one of the um, highest performing networks um, or schools uh, in general uh, in Memphis and in Tennessee. They operate a, uh, from grades K through uh, high school. Um, here's another school started by uh, African-American and former educator, uh, math teacher, who was focusing on how do we get um, low-income kids in our community to be uh, focused and engaged in school, but in particularly thinking about math. Um, and so their school specializes in uh, a lot of curriculum around um, making math exciting uh, in STEM and coursework. Um, but I mentioned those two, those two models because um, one, I think it is uh, really amazing whenever we think about schools of choice that majority of them are not founded by like just random people off the street. I think that's like a common misconception whenever we, we talk about um, any of these schools. Uh, but no, these schools are, are run by uh, born and bred, homegrown educators who spend a significant time uh, in the classroom and we're just frustrated in their traditional system uh, with their inability to change curriculum, be innovative, and think about you know, new approaches. And so they set out, they started their schools using these options that are available to them, and they're educating um, uh, thousands of students in our community for our community. Um, and I just think that is really powerful and, and you know, don't want to, uh, you know, miss that point that most of these schools um, you will find at the top are educators. They're not like crazy random people who just woke up one day and said, hey, I want to do this. Um, they're actually committed to supporting our students um, in their entire growth. Right. Um, so thinking about schools in Houston, uh, there's a school that opened, uh, this is the first full year that they've been open uh, by a Building Excellent School Fellow. So Building Excellent Schools is a fellowship program that cultivates school leaders and gives them 
time shadowing other high performing school leaders. Um, so this school is a Twala Academy, um, and it's nice because uh, they have a low uh, student to teacher ratio. Uh, they have a big emphasis on financial literacy, so a lot of the incentives are in cash or fake cash, so they, they earn money and they can buy different things with the money, um, but they are uh, learning a lot about financial literacy. Um, they um, have integrated technology into uh, their classroom um, and school overall in a way that I haven't seen before. Um, so the kids are using devices to actively um, interact with the teacher and interact with the presentation mm -hmm. on the board. Um, they also have a level of freedom to push back on what the teacher says that I have not seen in any other school. Um, that was really refreshing to me. It kind of reminded me of law school. Um, but it's healthy, right? It's like letting kids know that like, no, the teacher is not always right. It's great to have a healthy amount of skepticism while also being respectful. Um, so that's one really great school. Um, there is um, a fine arts network called the Rhodes School. Um, they're doing some really great work in serving um, kids that are um, artistically inclined, whether that's in the visual arts, musically, um, or like theatrically. Um, and then there's another school called ProVision that focuses on like community gardening and and that type of thing. And so it's a, s a slight focus on STEM, um, f but a big focus on he healthy eating um, and kind of integrating that lifestyle intergenerationally to make sure that the kids are not only being successful academically, but are also uh, leading healthy lives. Awesome. Okay, last one before we move on to audience questions. Um, I want to kind of close on outcomes and how do we, if not, you know, this previous slide was talking about how schools of choice show success for low income and urban students um, in, in measures that are not test scores. So if not test scores, um, how do we measure success? How do we ensure that charter schools, schools of choice are actually working? Because there are, we know they're not all 100% and, but just as there are traditional public schools, just as there are private schools that aren't necessarily working, um, so how do we measure that? And this chart shows that um, overwhelmingly students that come from the lowest quartile of income, of family income, are overwhelmingly challenged to graduate from, from college. So if that is a measure, if that is a way to continue to track these students beyond high school um, or otherwise, what are some ways that we can, and maybe you can speak to this having gone through, you know, gone through choice. Right. Um, I, I think there are a number of ways you can track this, right? Like, I think that the purpose of education is to create um, an informed and engaged citizenry that can live independently, um, and live a dignified life um, and also be engaged in our community, um, you know, at a f more than functional level, right? Um, so measuring success by attainment of bachelor's degrees is one way, right? But there are a lot of people that attain bachelor's degrees that are still getting jobs that won't pay the bills, right? So now you've gone and obtained a degree and have probably gone in student loan debt. Um, to, to, to get a degree that's not going to uh, make you successful ultimately. Um, I'm not an expert in this area in terms of like doing surveys, but I think there's a way that you could um, survey people in terms of uh, ultimate like earning power and household income um, or some other subjective um, metrics. Just overall satisfaction, um, like do you think that um, your education trajectory, whether you earned a certificate or earned an associate's degree, has set you up to do the type of work that you want to do and provide for your family in a, in a meaningful way? Maybe something like that. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think like, the intent behind education is like we're encouraging students to be lifelong learners and that, they're, that their quest uh, for that never stops. And so, you know, outside of a test score, I think, you know, is this school preparing students for life beyond 
you know, high school. Um, I think we actually need to be doing more to think about career, technical, mm -hmm. vocational education. Um, you know, if you talk to uh, business um, in, in any of your states, I think they'll tell you that the workforce um, has shrunk for a lot of our trade uh, jobs and skilled workers, where students, instead of, you know, pushing this idea of college, we're thinking about, you know, getting an apprenticeship or, you know, um, uh, thinking about uh, different models uh, where students leave with certifications and skills they can take right into career um, and, and, and get a really good job that's going to pay them well uh, and they can have a meaningful life or they can compound that and keep going. Um, uh, she mentioned, you know, the idea about what it means to be a good citizen, how we're teaching children to engage um, outside of school uh, in civics and government engagement that they understand, uh, or we all know, right, we make it in this world with access and opportunity, and the majority of students that we're talking about um, have neither. And so can we have schools uh, and systems that are, you know, preparing kids, putting them in, in spaces, encouraging them to travel and explore and get outside of where they live? Um, those are things that I'm looking at beyond a test score, I think, uh, and, and this is coming from like a horrible test taker. I'm like, if you looked at any of my test scores, they, they wouldn't tell you anything about me or who I am or what I know. And so I think those are ways that we should be looking and thinking about how schools are preparing students. Good First question was, can the older white conservative face of ed reform successfully pass the baton to millennials to lead the movement in a more inclusive and diverse way? That's a good question. Please. <laughs> Please. Yes. Next. We're, we're here to catch it. Was that it, you guys? That's no, it. I mean, so for that question, I think I think I think the question is yes, they can do it. Um, I think the the question is will they? Um, and what we've seen in this work is more times than not they won't, right? I think the the. Uh, this work, this movement, the narrative, the conversation around it, it's so much better when uh, you have young people of color in rooms and spaces talking about this work, who have experienced this work. I think part of the, the challenge with this, and, and a lot of movements, not even just ed reform, is like the people having the conversations are not millennials, they're an older generation, they're stuck in their old ways, and we know the challenges and chaos that creates. So. That's all I'll say on that. Next question is, how can we move to include traditional public schools as schools of choice in the conversation today? And if I understand this correctly, yeah. I'm thinking it sounds like innovation schools is yeah. something? Okay. Um, yeah, so I mean, what's really interesting about, uh, about this question is like in Memphis, we, um, we had to do this. Um, and I think everyone should do this because we're talking about like 51 million students attending school uh, across this country. There's no way that public, choice- Public school. Public yeah. schools anyway. Um, but there's no way that, that we can solve the challenges uh, alone or without help from traditional district schools. And so, you know, in Memphis, um, our, our state came in a few years ago, created their uh, Achievement School District to uh, transform schools in the bottom 5%. And they said, hey, we're going to take, you know, 60 plus schools. Um, and our district was like, wait a second, you know, um, you're trying to transform schools. We can do the same thing. And so instead of you taking all of our schools, let's figure out work together and like, split the difference. You take some schools, we'll take some schools. You try your approach, we'll try ours. Um, and we have the same goal, then we'll get there faster. And I think that is more of what and how these conversations should evolve is, you know, let's figure out how we can work together to improve these schools, because we can't do it alone. Right, I definitely think that uh, traditional public schools are part of the choice school conversation. They're the largest part of it still. Yeah. Um, and there are some districts in Texas that are doing some really great work, um, taking some of the best practices um, and lessons learned from like charter school management organizations and some innovative private schools and incorporating that into their day-to-day uh, -day coursework. Um, San Antonio ISD is one of those schools. Um, they are now co-locating with some uh, charter operators, so like KIPP in San Antonio, they co-locate. Um, they have created schools that are diverse by design. They're partnering with um, industry leaders like HEB, which is a large uh, grocery store chain here in Texas, um, to create some um, interesting technology schools that would if you walked into them, you would think that it was an independent charter school, but they are district schools. Um, and then just outside of Houston in Spring Branch ISD, um, there's what they call a Sky Partnership, which is uh, Spring Branch, KIPP, and YES, um, where they partner together to co-locate some schools 
um, share college and career readiness curriculums uh, amongst all of their college counselors so that um, so for some of the kids that are not in the YES branch or the KIPP branch, they can still have access to that kind of curriculum. Um, and so I think they are definitely choice schools. Uh, traditional districts have magnet schools or gifted and talented schools um, or vanguard schools, like I told you we call those in Texas. So there are lots of options that are out there. Um, I, so the, in, in a previous panel when asked choice, Dr. Chris Emden said I'm dope for schools and I'm against black schools. Are low performing charters accountable? We, we talked a little bit about accountability, but um, there is a, an accountability system on charter, in charter schools um, in Colorado, if you want to speak to that, um, or in Tennessee, what that accountability system looks like for existing charter schools. So I sit on the board of a charter school in Denver, and we have, we're operating in four sites, and every single time that we go get evaluated, um, I have to be part of a conversation. So it's, it's, I would make the argument, I oversaw a large portion of the accountability system in the state, working at the governor's office and working with um, the commissioner of education, and our, there's, a couple of different authorizers, and the amount of times that charter schools have to be evaluated are more rigorous and come up. We close bad, low-performing charter schools more often than we do traditional schools, and I'm not saying that just to be a hater, but it's true. Like, there are, right now, a school down the street from where I live that has been operating with less than 30% of kids being able to read um, for, like, decades. Um, so. I, I hear that, and I think that that's, that's, that's the purpose of these conversations, is, is like, I'm not trying to push bad schools on you, no matter what flavor that comes in, and I think that that should be the measure, because these are kids, these are babies, like, if, you, if you're not part of that conversation around ac accountability, too, like, we're hypocrites. Um, what I'll say, um, you know, about Tennessee, uh, and, and I'll preface that with saying, you know, not every charter school, right, is 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 the same. You know, uh, the charter school in in Colorado is is authorized different than how our charter school in in Tennessee is authorized, and I think that that's a separate conversation. But I just want to mention that. But in Tennessee, you know, we have automatic uh, default closure law. That is, you know, if if a school hits that priority list. Um, it's closed, um, and we actually have a bill in our in our um, general assembly right now um, where we're trying to amend that a little bit because um, we we obviously want to give schools room, but but like as I mentioned, like you know, all of us are of the the mind that we have to close low performing charter schools, and we can't delay um, uh, that for too long. We need good schools and quality seats to be open and accessible, and we need uh, low performing schools that are not serving kids, charter, traditional, public, or otherwise is closed, um, and that's just our mindset. So in Texas, we have three authorizers, right? So it's the state education agency, um, local independent school districts, or universities. Um, there are very few universities that authorize charters, um, but thinking about the ones with the state, uh, we operate under a three strikes rule. So. Uh, if a school does not hit its metrics, whether it's on academic performance or financial performance, three years in a row, and that's looking at either one of those, it doesn't have to be the same metric three years in a row, they're automatically shut down, no questions asked. Um, but to Evie's point, on the, those same academic metrics, there are traditional public schools that don't hit them all the time. And there are, in fact, some that have not been hitting those metrics since the 70s. Um, and they're still open. Millennials are supporting teachers' unions that push against choice, but when it comes to their children, they want choice. How do we bridge these mindsets? Are millennials supporting unions that push against choice? I don't have a... I mean, I, I, I think it's just like a, I mean, a conversation. I, you know, I use myself as an example. I mean, like, I grew up in a union hall. You know, my mom's a steward of a union uh, for United Auto Workers. And, like, we grew up, like, supporting unions no matter what um, uh, for the right for workers. And, and, and so for me, you know, I had a birthday party in, in, in the, the union hall, like, all my birthdays through, like, my 16th birthday. Um, and, and the way that I always reconcile this is it's just, like, you know, Approaching the conversation from a labor aspect, right? The teachers union has a has a real purpose and responsibility to support its teachers. Um, and, and obviously, there's some disconnect between, you know, 
labor and worker protections and like this this kind of choice conversation. Um, but I just have to talk to folks um, because we know a lot of teachers, or at least I know a lot of teachers who are millennial teachers who are not quite sold on you know money coming out of their their paycheck as as little as it already was uh, to support a union in like not having any real control over conversations or how things evolve. Um, but we know that teachers union has a valuable purpose. And so it's just like talking to them and it's like, hey, you know, you have a kid, you want to exercise choice, but then why is that not okay for this? And, um, you know, we just try and always, um, we just always try and be a friend, even, even if folks are not friendly towards us. Uh, but I think the more that we talk about this and kind of expose some of the quiet conversations that we have, the, the better off we'll be long term. I respectfully disagree. I think that they don't, I, in my experience, and what I've seen nationally and locally, we just had a teacher strike, um, I think some of these folks are not interested in a conversation and haven't been interested in a while, and that's okay. Um, I think we have to be willing to move on and build new supporters elsewhere um, that want to be focused on kids. I think that there are a lot of people who represent adults that partake in the education system, and I support that. I am fully supportive of that. I also want to make sure that we are also... There was no conversation in Denver during the last teacher strike that included children. Um, it was all about which is important, I, I, I want to emphasize, like, it, there are portions of this conversation that are important, but there is nothing more important to me than the children that didn't get to go to school um, or that had to be dropped off at libraries um, for literally line items that got moved around in a contract. Um, there weren't millions of dollars that got negotiated. There weren't, it wasn't, to me, it was not worth um, those kids being out of school. It was a change in $1,000. It was the original negotiation that was put on the table by the first Latina woman superintendent of Denver that ended up being what they walked away with. So to me, that conversation wasn't a conversation that we were invited to. It was a conversation about adults that needed to galvanize support, and that was for support for adults and teachers, which is important. But if we're going to have this conversation, they need to also be coming to the table, and we need to invite higher ed to the table because this isn't an issue about us not supporting teachers. It's a much more robust conversation that we need to have about systems and pathways um, that it has to include everybody and there has to be a willingness. Like, I'm not gonna keep going up to you and wanting to be nice. Like, it'd be like me hitting on a guy all night and him constantly being like, nah, girl, I'm not interested in you and keep going back and being like, no, but like, let me holler at you like, because you look at, like, no. They've told me no multiple times and they've been mean about it like outright mean about it and me continuing to go back. And that's what it's felt like to me and I've been in those rooms many times and I say this with like personal experience, like there has to be that acknowledgement. So I hear you, but also. Yeah, <laughs> so a couple to... things. So I think, I think the question was about like millennial, not necessarily union leadership. And what I heard from you were, what your response was, was a lot of right, what we talked about with our movement and leadership. And so if we, if we have millennial teachers who more times than not are not as engaged on these issues, they're just doing what their leadership tells them, then I do think we need to make a much, a much more intentional effort to connect with those teachers and carve out a narrative about how we support those teachers because I think too many times in this movement on our side, what we've done is attack union with a teacher attack rhetoric and we end up in this situation. And I think too many times we talk about folks on the other side who you know, won't support us or not, like they're the enemy, but we haven't done much to actually engage them. Not leadership, because we know leadership is challenging, but we're talking about a certain group of folks who we haven't engaged. And so I hear you, I, we all have the same experiences. I too have similar union experiences, but I, I, again, if we're talking about, you know, reaching and engaging people where they are, like I think giving up on, on them just for the sake of old experiences, it's not gonna get us anywhere, and especially if we're trying to change narratives. So I hear you, we're, we're good, but that's just my, my response. <laughs> okay, I hate to cut this short, but um, we are 
pretty much we are out of time. So gotcha. real quick lightning round, and also you guys, happy hour starts soon, so you can finish that conversation there. <laughs> uh, I'm going to kind of adjust the premise of this, this final question because I do want us to take a look forward. So uh, I'm going to adjust it and not say ed reform, but I, think, I do think we're on the brink of a revolution. So what does the future of education look like going forward uh, with millennials in charge? Real quick. I think in short, it looks differentiated. I mean, I think that um, there are more options to serve the needs of a, div a very, and more like ever increasingly diverse group of students and families. I think that's the only way that we can meet the needs of our students um, and have them appropriately prepared um, to be productive members of the workforce. Okay. Mindel, do you have something? You were writing no, something down furiously. No, okay. I made Mindel mad. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you so much, guys. We're out of time. I'm so sorry that we went over. Um, thank you for spending your afternoon with us.